Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I see a lot of familiar photos. I'd say faces, but on um, Zoom, it's photos. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is the Wealth Essentials for Entertainment series. We're so lucky to have Adam Scott with us here today, a certified financial planner. Um, he's going to share us his expertise on creating a perfect portfolio. No, um, this is the first part of this series on this subject. Um, and in the format of today's seminar, we will have questions at the end. So feel free to put them in the chat as we continue the seminar. Now I think it's time for Adam to take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jasmine and Ace for hosting this webinar. Welcome to today's webinar, Perfect Portfolio Design. My name is Adam Scott and I am the principal of Wellacre Wealth Advisors. That is me pre-COVID. This is me post-COVID. Today's subject is near and dear to my heart, as those who've been on my calls before will know. Because when I was young, my father taught me how to create a perfect portfolio. And then five years later, ignored his own advice and put his entire life savings, our entire, entire life savings, into one sure thing, which sure enough went bankrupt. We were financially devastated and never recovered. The trauma of that event made me determined that such a thing would never happen to me or anybody else I cared about. And that same mission to help others ultimately led me to form Wellacre Wealth Advisors, where we help families and business owners navigate financial complexity in the modern world. Before you set out on a journey, you need to have a purpose and you need to know your destination or you might end up dying of thirst and hunger in the desert somewhere, at least if you come from Los Angeles, like I do. So the purpose of my journey is to see my daughter, who's flipping hot dogs in Vail, Colorado, at the ski resort. And I would like to go and see her. So I have my purpose, to visit my daughter, and I have my destination, Vail, Colorado. Now I need to create a roadmap. And then next, before I set out, I've got a plan for the unexpected and I've got to make sure I build or have the right vehicle. The same thing happens when you set out on your financial journey. You've got to make sure you know your purpose. You've got to make sure you know your destination, map out your journey, plan for the unexpected and build the right vehicle which in our case is the perfect portfolio. What is the perfect portfolio? Well, to start with the end in mind, the perfect portfolio is the one that is right for you. Now that may sound like a truism, but it's one that many investors ignore at their peril and due to their ignorance. And it often leads to catastrophic mistakes. So how do we go about designing the portfolio that's right for you? We need to excavate before we elevate. And we need to know your purpose. We need to identify your values. Ask yourself, what's important to you about money? Why do you care about money? What is the most important thing? Is it security as it is for many people? Is it freedom, my wife's favorite value? She would love a few more of these if I gave them to her. But for me, this is more important, experiential enjoyment. This is my family with my sister's families going on vacation to the Alps for the first time in 30 years, a lifelong dream. This is Alex Hummel who climbed up El Capitan without ropes, the first person to do so. Is he crazy? He obviously cares nothing about security, but he does live on a shoestring. And Alex Hummel has achieved enormous prestige for his achievement. Power is important to some, and indeed, I think it's sometimes underestimated or misconstrued the importance of power and money, because to me, having 
money enables you to have power over your own life. And I've impressed upon my sons to be careful with their money because every time they're giving it away, they are giving away a little bit of their power, the power to take control and the power to possibly make a difference in the world. Now, this is one of the greatest uses, of course, of our financial resources, and certainly something that my wife and I adhere to. We supported an organization called Multiplying Good. We're on the board in Los Angeles, where we really make a difference in the lives of Los Angeles children. And equally, in fact, with your investments, you can now make a difference because there's a big movement to do what they call environmental, social, and governance investing, ESG investing, and SRA, SRI, socially responsible investing. So you can actually do well and do good at the same time. So think about what you want to do with your money before you even start constructing your portfolio. Identify your values. What is important to you? And also look underneath these values because sometimes there's something underneath them that's even more important. You know, underneath freedom, my wife wants freedom, but more important than freedom may be financial security to her, although actually she sees them as one as the same. And when I look at what's more important than any of these things to me, it's family, friends, and community. This is my family at the wedding of a great friend just before COVID hit. Now, my kids and my wife would laugh at me saying that family, friends, and community are the most important thing to me and my highest priority because they would say my work is my highest priority. And that made, made me reflect. And I realized, yes, that one of the most important things to me is my personal mission to help protect and to help educate, protect and elevate. What's your mission? And do you have things that are more important than money? I think we all do. But think of how financial resources can help play into those and either give you more time for your friends or your personal fulfillment or can help elevate those things, the faith and the spirituality or the commitments that you have. So all of this, once we establish our values, is going to enable us to, to focus in on our goals and form our goals that are in alignment with our values. And some critical uh, exercises to help identify your goals are to think, if you didn't have to work anymore, what would you do? And where do you want to be when you're 45, 55, 65, 75? Sit down and think about that. And of course, ultimately, we've got to come up with a dollar figure of what we need to get where we want to go. Once we've done all that, we're going to get a clearer picture and we're going to know our destination. For our clients, we help. We find it very helpful to come up with a picture like this that both encapsulates their present life, but also shows us where we're headed so that we can keep on track and make sure that, that everything is directed to what is most important to them. For myself, I put at the center something I don't currently have, that this boat, just as something I would love to be able to have, maybe with some friends, so that my children, who are now moving back to Los Angeles after 10 years of living on the East Coast, my older sons, I want to be able to bribe them to come and spend some time with mom and dad. And I think maybe having a boat will be a good way to do that. So now we have our destination. We've got to plan our journey and come up with a roadmap. And when we... Uh, do that in finance, we got to do the same thing. we got to create our financial roadmap. Of course, we got to know where we're starting from. And this is where I'm starting from in my journey to Vail, Colorado. I'm starting from this beautiful place in Topanga, California. Of course, it's a bit more cut and dried when it comes to finances. We start with a balance sheet. This is the kind of balance sheet that we make for clients in a financial planning program. And I find it really 
grounding, to be able to have everything in one place and know exactly what one's financial picture is. What's your starting point? Once you have a starting point, you can start creating a financial plan. And so we're able to do this with software and project under many different scenarios at the current rate of spending and the current rate of, uh, of saving and the current and what we estimate uh, the risk on the retirement portfolio to be, how much it's going to grow, we can see how these resources are going to play out for our, for our clients' lives. And we're able to change decisions and try different decisions to see what impact they might have. Now, this is one of my favorite pages in the financial plan because it shows in this gray box up here how much the client can spend, in this case, well, they're actually spending $130,000. And in this case, they can spend more than that because we can see that on this, uh, over on the left here, on this bar chart, we see that that's the size of their portfolio. Even though they're spending money, their portfolio is getting bigger and bigger over the next 40 years of their life. Till the age 100, they're going to have $60 million when they die. Now, oftentimes, of course, it doesn't look like this. The client... Uh, may be spending $130,000, but their portfolio is only going to permit them, say, $100,000 a year, in which case you see something diff very different, maybe something like more on the right here, of the portfolio going up while they're saving before they're retiring and depleting down to zero at age 100 when they put the uh, last quarter in the gumball machine, as one of my clients says. In fact, often, of course, people's resources... It, uh, run out way before this if they're spending too much money. So this client is very fortunate, but it enables them to make some decisions. Maybe they don't want to end up with $60 million on their deathbed, even though $60 million in 40 years is going to be a lot less than it is today. Uh, when you account for inflation, it's going to be more like $10 million or $20 million in today's terms. But still, that's an awful lot of money. And they could increase their spending a lot and never run out of money. Or even better, maybe they could retire early. Now, if you're not so lucky and your financial plan shows you running out of money, or maybe it shows you've got sufficient money if you retire in a more simple way, this might be attractive. You can change your destination. So do your plan. You don't have to stick to your destination. You can change it based on the information you have. This is a cottage I came across in the woods on the, the islands in the San Juan Islands in the Puget Sound, completely off the grid, an idyllic lifestyle. You can leave the, live there very affordably, very cheaply, as I came across many people who are happily doing so. Once you know where you're going, you do need to plan for the unexpected. I don't want to end up in the desert, broken down like this. And I've got to make sure I'm going to be hitting snow, not to forget my snow chains. And indeed, that spare tire better be pumped up and ready to go. I need to look at all the different routes because maybe one of some of the roads will be blocked. I've got to look at the weather conditions and figure out what might happen. There could be all kinds of different weather. Similarly, when we're doing a financial, when we're looking into the financial future, we have to try to do the same. We have to plan for the unexpected and think of all kinds of different scenarios. So imagine that I gave you $100 today and you invested it and you just kept it invested for 10 years from today. What is going to happen to the stock market? Of course, you have no idea. I have no idea. Nobody has any idea. Many different scenarios could happen. Here, we've outlined three potential scenarios. We have the green scenario, where for the next six or seven years, the markets keep going, rising. That's called a bull market. We're in a bull market right now. So the markets keep rising for six or seven years. And then maybe after six or seven years, we suddenly get a hangover from all this debt. And we have a bear market for three or four years. And your, and your money declines, but it ends up after 10 years of being $300. Alternatively, maybe we start off with a bear market. 
in a few weeks, maybe the market's going to start tanking and the market's going to go down like this red line. And then finally, after five or six years, uh, we're going to get over again the, the, the debt crunch and the market's suddenly going to take off. And we're going to have a bull market and we're going to end up at the same place of $300. Or maybe we're going to have a middle route like this blue line where we just move steadily upwards to the same $300. Which of those scenarios is preferable? Well, they're all three the same. They all end up with the same amount of money at the end. They all have the same average rate of return. When you divide the overall return by the number of years, you get the same average return. So it should make no difference. Although I suspect most people would prefer to have the green journey or the blue journey rather than the red journey. However, all investors are different. And there are two critical classes of investors that make this journey very different because most people don't just put in $100 and leave it there for 10 years. People are either saving or they are spending. They are saving into their retirement vehicles with their 401ks and their IRAs. They're in the workforce or they're retirees and they're taking distributions and they're spending down their retirement portfolios. And it turns out that that creates very different results. If you are saving, you're a 401k, you're saving into your 401k and you're in the workforce. And let's say you start off with zero in year zero here. And after year one, you put $10,000 of your hard-earned wages into your 401k. After year two, you put another $10,000 in and you do that for the next 10 years. Now, if you do that into the bear market, that is the best scenario. It's way better for the 401k saver because even though those hard-earned savings, when you put in that $10,000 year after year in those early years, it's declining. However, the actual value of the portfolio is going up because the amount that the, your portfolio is declining is pretty minimal compared to the extra 10000 that you're putting in every year at the beginning. And what you're doing is you're buying stocks on sale. You're buying two-for-one bargains. So by the time the market turns around after year six or year seven, you've got way more investments than if the investments had been expensive, like in the green situation. And then when the market takes off, you're going to double, uh, you know, triple, quadruple your money. Of course, it takes a great amount of resilience to keep investing when you're the 401k investor uh, and you, the, when you're in the workforce and you're investing uh, into a bear market when that savings keep going down. But you've got to have the self-discipline to keep doing it. Now, ironically, if uh, uh, that such investors, even 401k investors, you know, people in the workforce, much prefer to be investing into a bull market when it's going up. Everyone's really excited right now. They're excited about their Tesla. They're excited about their Bitcoin, their Dogecoin, um, and uh, and their GameStop. But they would, uh, all these young investors would have been much better off if the markets had stayed where they were back in March. Uh, of 2020 and stayed low for the next five or six years because they would have bought stocks on sale. Because unfortunately, what may happen eventually, if you're a young investor investing into a bull market, is that by the time you get to retirement, that the market you uh, the market starts turning into a bear market and you never get the same kind of appreciation that you would have done in the other scenario. However, things are completely different different, of course, for the retired investor. The investor who is taking distributions out of their account. Let's look at what a bear market does to them. If you start off with $100,000 at the beginning of your retirement and you're taking out $15,000 a year, imagine if your portfolio was to decline due to a bear market. Maybe after a couple of years, you're taking out the 15,000 and due to the decline, it's gone for 100,000 to 50,000. And then you take out another 15,000. That's a 30% distribution from your portfolio. Of course, it's not going to last long. 
In this example, it's gone after about four or five years. Even if it wasn't gone, it's going to get so reduced that even if the most raging bull market comes along, you've got not enough money left in that portfolio to make a difference and to sustain you for the rest of your life. So for the retiree, it is crucial to protect themselves from this, what we, uh, uh, what we call sequence of return risk. It's very dangerous for a retiree to have their portfolio decline at the beginning of their retirement. So it's very important that they manage and minimize the risk. Conversely, if the retiree has a bull market and then has a bear market at the end of their retirement, it really has very little effect on them. So I'm going to go back to that. So what this shows is that when you receive a return can be far more important than the average return. Because all these scenarios have had exactly the same average return over the 10 years. But one scenario is going to devastate a retiree who's incorrectly positioned. And the other scenario is going to be very bad for the young investor. So it's, criti it's critical to be aware of sequence of return risk. How can you try to model that? Well, we do a thing called Monte Carlo simulation, where we look at all the different outcomes of a portfolio, and we try to plan around that with the amount that a client is spending and the amount of return they must get. Because in the short term, returns are extremely uh, unpredictable. But over the long term, they get more and more predictable. So we can have a good idea of what ultimately things are going to look like for, for our portfolio. Now, if we don't do that and we don't have a financial roadmap, what are the dangers? First of all, of course, maybe you're not saving sufficiently for your desired future. Or maybe like uh, you're saving too much for, for your future, that you don't want to die leaving $60 million and you could retire early or you could give a lot to an organization uh, and a charity that means a lot to you or you could make a, a, a difference in your kids' lives. Most importantly, it may be that, your, that the retiree's portfolio that's doing so well is overexposed to unnecessary risk. If they don't need to take on all that risk, like the example we showed, they're going to end up with $60 million. Well, they don't need to take on a lot of risk. They can have minimal risk. Make sure they have no downside risk. Uh, so, because we don't want them to get hit by that sequence of return risk that we showed. Now, there's another, there's the opposite of that. I come across many, uh, 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 many clients or, you know, potential clients that are underexposed to necessary risk. Maybe they're in their 40s, 60s, or even sometimes in their 60s and 70s, and they need to have a little bit more risk. They're sitting in cash in the bank, potentially millions of dollars, sitting in very conservative investments. And what this is showing is that if you're earning 1% or 2% in a bank, and you'd be lucky to get that now, but let's say you were earning 1% or 2%, over 20 years, that's all you're going to get. And yeah, your portfolio is not going to go up and down much, but it's not going to grow much either. And you know what? It's going to get eaten by taxes and by inflation. And you're actually going to get a negative return. So what's happening is in real terms, in our inflation-adjusted uh, dollars after taxes, you are going broke slowly. Now, why do people do this? They do it to avoid the risk that we see in this blue bar. That is what a proper allocation of a portfolio might be. And it shows the wide variety of outcomes that could happen in the first year of being invested. You might lose 10, 20%, or you might be up 20 to 30%. You don't know. But as time goes on, you get a moral degree of certainty that over time, over 20 years, we can predict that your average return is going to be somewhere between a minimum of 3% and a maximum of almost 10%. Well, what does that mean? That means your minimum return is going to be the same 
as if you just let the man money sit in the bank. So you're going to be no worse off than just letting the money sit in the bank. But your maximum return could result in a portfolio that is six times bigger and will hopefully have outpaced inflation and taxes. However, there are times that you want to be very cautious with your allocations, and that's for your short-term goals, be it buying my boat or buying a house, uh, a second home or a first home, or putting your kids through college. And then when it comes to your long-term desti uh, long destination, know your final destination. Do you want to downsize your goals and live off the grid in this house? Or do you want to upgrade your dreams to here? Know your final destination. And once you know your final destination, you got to build the vehicle for getting there. Now, this is my destination. My daughter doing a ski jump uh, at the back of the hot dog stand in Vail. And this is the vehicle that looks like it would be a trip for me to drive to get there. So what's the vehicle we're going to use to get you through retirement? We're going to use a portfolio and the engineer is going to be modern portfolio theory or one of the engineers. And this brilliant man, Harry Markowitz, who came up with the theory of modern portfolio theory. Now, what does it tell us? Its core concepts are that before modern portfolio theory, investors thought it was all about picking stocks. But what Harry Markowitz proved was that asset allocation is, results in far more of the returns than individual equity picking. Indeed, Later research showed that 92% of returns, it's all about the way we put the assets together, the be it stocks and bonds, or be it international equities with US equities, be it what we call small cap with large cap. It's the way we put them together that is what results in the returns, not about stock picking. And we're going to get more into that in the next session. It also shows how the kind of risk that my father took by putting all his money in one stock can be completely eliminated. That's what we call unsystematic risk. And there's a thing called the efficient frontier, which we've looked into before and we'll go into more detail next time. Our aim is to get onto this red line where we get the maximum amount of return for the minimum amount of risk. Now, all of these different asset classes are lying below the efficient uh, frontier. In fact, we can see that bonds over here and the S&P up here, bonds and stocks, are underneath the efficient frontier. The magic is that when we combine them all together, we can design a portfolio where they, together they get up onto the efficient frontier, where they get more return with less risk. And indeed, that is illustrated here, where we see a mix of stocks and bonds. And right at the bottom, we see that an all bond portfolio actually has more risk along here and less return up there than a bond portfolio with a little bit of stocks. We're going to get into all of that in more detail in part two. But for now, we need to know our purpose. We need to know our destination. We need to map our journey. We need to plan for the unexpected. And we need to build the right vehicle. And if we don't, we might end up like that. In the desert, in a broken down car. So... Next up, next month, will be Perfect Portfolio Design Part 2, then Estate Planning Essentials, and then what insurance do you really need? Please connect with our team and reach out to us with any questions or for us to do a second opinion of your financial situation. This is us, and we're here to help you grow and protect your wealth.